The name of my talk here, So Much Science, So Little Action, might seem a bit strange at a conference where we're hearing about so much fantastic science, which gives us a lot of hope for the future. I guess where I'm coming from is if we stop right now learning anything else new in terms of our science, can we still improve what we're doing? And so the, the topic is actually trying to look at that gap between where is science now and how much better can we do with what we've got? So even if we don't even continue moving on. Are clinicians actually being able to uh, integrate that science into practice? What are you going to do when you leave here? If I went and talked to you next week, all those clinicians in the room, how many of you would have changed something substantially in your practice as a result of this conference? Maybe yes, maybe no. It's something to think about. If I talk to you in three months' time, could you show me that your patients were actually getting better outcomes? So that's an interesting question. How can we fill that gap between where the science is at and what's happening on the ground level with our patients, with their pain, with their suffering, with the resources that we've got in the system? So just before I do start that presentation, I'd really like to thank the Noi Group and David for inviting us here to share some of our experience in training practitioners and in trying to wrestle with this particular health behaviour change challenge ourselves. Health uh, Change Australia is actually um, a team of practitioners, so a bit like Noi Group, we're sitting a little bit outside of the system, not always an easy thing to do, but it's amazing and I'd like to really suggest every single clinician in the room never think that you can't have an effect because the system might be big but it's made up of individuals and unless we change our practice on a daily basis, all of us, then the system doesn't change. You need that bottom up as well as a top down scientific approach. How do we join that in the middle? So that's what I'll talk about. So what's the problem here? We know that scientists are coming up with some fantastic information but with all of that inspiration that you're going to walk away with, those of you who are clinicians, again, what do you do? You get back to work on Monday, you've got the same time pressures, you've got that imperative for churn, you've got parameters from the system. It makes it difficult, doesn't it? How many workshops, how many conferences, how many bits of training have you walked away and said, wow, that was fantastic? But it's never quite managed to integrate itself into your practice. And you keep saying, wow, I really should do something about that. But when have I got time? When have I got the ability? Does your system and your workplace actually support you to do that? Who gives you the extra time? So the systems are an issue too. And what about patients? Why don't they go away and do what we're asking them to do? <laughs> you know, if they would do that, if patients did all the things that we told them that would work for them according to the evidence-based treatment recommendations, would they get better outcomes? Well, you would think so, but according to the statistics, people don't do that. Why not? Is it that patients are difficult? None of us would do that, would we? Who here's got perfect health behaviours in the room? <laughs> yeah, why not? Is it because you don't know what to do? So it's not all about the knowledge, is it? And I guess that's our message, is are we treating the whole treatment process and scientific information as just an information conduit? Is it going to work to take information, pass that on to clinicians, and then pass that on to patients? Are you going to get much of an effect? Well, you're going to get some effect because some people can take that knowledge and use it. So this is all about how do we use that knowledge? Some people won't, though. So if clinicians even know the information, do they have the ability, the readiness, the willingness and the ability to integrate it into practice, even once you've got the knowledge? And then do the patients, even if they have that information about pain, for example, do they have what it takes to actually do something about that on a daily basis? What's getting in the way for them? So there are a few things that are happening, and it's not just at the patient level. As you can see, and this has been another theme that's been prevalent in the conference, First of all, the themes about patient expectations, but secondly, that theme about, with all of our scientific knowledge, how much are we actually crossing over? And we're talking about potentiation in, in a number of the presentations as well. How do you actually potentiate the impact from science? Well, when you get people from those different groups together, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to have an ex exponential effect rather than each, or, uh, each uh, line of inquiry just following its own. We know that, but how do we actually get that happening? And the issue is that 
a lot of science actually acts as if you've got separate groups of patients, but is that the case? Well, of course not. We share the same sorts of patients, but from a patient's perspective often, they're getting lots of different information. And the question to ask ourselves is who's actually going to integrate that? Is there anyone that actually has a role of integrating that? Can't leave it with the GPs, they've got seven minute consultations, how are they going to do that? Do the physiotherapists feel that that's their role? Or is it something maybe that's a bit too psychosocial and not enough biopsychosocial, so maybe that's a psychologist? Does the psychologist really understand in the context of the person's overall physiology their pain reactions? So ha who's going to do this? And I su would suggest that at the moment, there's really no one nominated in the whole system who helps the patient bring all of this together. Now, more and more case managers are doing that as well, not only in uh, return to work sort of situations and injury rehabilitation, but also in public health, a lot more case managers are starting to take on this role and that's good to see. But is it worth every single contact within the system integrating behaviour change, not so that you're doing a whole behaviour change interview, but to the extent that for what you're asking people to do, you're helping them to actually do it. You're making sure they've got the knowledge they need, the readiness, the importance and the confidence to actually do it. Do we even ask these questions? So what do we need for patients to get better health outcomes? As you follow this flowchart, hopefully that will become a little bit apparent. So they need to achieve the physiological or other targets, which means they need to adhere to treatment recommendations, which involves changing behaviour. So you can have information, but does that mean that you do anything about it? In order to change behaviour though, we need to change our thinking, we need to plan, we need to change our beliefs, our expectations. We've been talking a lot about patient expectations as a barrier to their action. How do we change the expectations rather than think of the patient as passive, coming with a set set of expectations? Because how we talk to them when we very first interact with a patient is going to change their expectations. And actually, it's quite easy to do. So is the patient ready, willing and able to take the actions we're recommending? And so far, the clinician hasn't even come into it. So that's the next step. For a clinician to provide best practice treatment and communicate it in the way that a patient is more ready, willing and able and statistically more likely to take action, how do you do that? Think of your own practice. So I guess that's a big question there. And also in taking those evidence-based treatment recommendations, do you know what to do with it? The science here has been fantastic, a lot of great information. Do you know what to do with it? So I guess there's a challenge there too for the scientists and academics to be really thinking and get some feedback going with the clinicians. Is this something you can use? If not, what do you need in order to be able to use that in your clinic so that then your patients can use that information? Because the clinicians are there in the middle and if you don't help the clinicians take on the knowledge and know how to use it, then it doesn't get to the patients. So in order to get better patients' outcomes, what needs to happen? Let's look at a slightly different flowchart. So that last flowchart is just within this arrow here. So what needs to happen for clinicians to provide best practice treatment? Well, they need to adhere to the recommendations. How do we know? Do we benchmark? Do clinicians, do we as clinicians know what best practice is and where we stand? In fact, I've seen it uh, in the literature that they, they've asked groups of clinicians, these were, happen to be doctors and specialists, and they ask them, who here in the room believes that they're in the top 50% of their profession? Just about everyone put up their hand. <laughs> Not surprising. Who here believes that they're in the top 10% of their profession? Most people put up their hand. Which is interesting if you think that potentially you're representative of the profession. I won't get you to do that here. <laughs> um, but do people realise that they're maybe not even meeting those benchmarks because we don't know what they are? And we're very scared to ask clinicians what they're doing and have a look and get them to actually even self-evaluate. So that's another interesting conundrum. So clinicians need to change their behaviour. And in order to change a clinician's behaviour, they need to change their thinking and they need to plan and they need to change their own attitudes and expectations. So they've got to be ready, willing and able to make the changes that are coming from the scientific knowledge. 
So the people who are training clinicians, and you know, HCA is one of those groups, this is something certainly we really wrestle with. We get people coming back and say, oh no, it was great, but you know, I'm not really using it. So, if, we, if we're not really, um, if people are not able to use what you're training them in, then that, all that training dollar goes to waste, all that time goes to waste. So I, I think very much from our professional point of view, and it's probably why David's asked us to come along here, is how do we make sure that training matters, that clinicians are actually able to use the material and go out and use it with patients? So what's required for patient success? Now, if you have a look at, um, at some of these, you know, what we're trying to achieve with our patients, it can give us some ideas about what we need to do ourselves as clinicians. So this is probably something you relate to in this particular forum. So you have initial in injury, you know that with the passive treatment cycle, and again, patient expectations come in expecting a lot of pas uh, passive treatment often, you'll get a short-term improvement of symptoms, but without behaviour change, you tend to keep cycling back, and that's when clients come back into your rooms over and over again without a lot of things changing. Frustrating for us, frustrating for patients. But with behaviour change, you can get people um, engaged in active treatment, and ultimately, that's what we need. It's the patient that's got to live with their condition and self-manage on a daily basis. Overall, the percentage of time that patients spend with clinicians is very, very short. So how do we get that to happen? It requires some change. So that's interesting. Then what's required for clinician success? And it's exactly the same pattern. If we go to uh, conferences, workshops, seminars, if we read, a certain, we'll take on a certain amount of information. But what are we doing with that? Without behaviour change, it's not very useful. So what we need clinicians to do, and what we need to help clinicians to do, is to engage in an active learning cycle. But what does that mean? It means that we need to change our behaviour. And that's not easy to do, because we've still got our time pressures. We're very ingrained in our own habits. And you would know, all of us would know, certainly as a clinician I know, that once you've done your training at uni, you come out, you get in your habits, whether they be good habits or bad habits, and it's really hard to shift that. So let's have a look at generally what needs to occur for anyone to make behaviour changes, take action. That is patients, clinicians, scientists, anyone in the community, a child learning how to make a cup of tea for the first time. You need knowledge and understanding, and that's where conferences like theirs are absolutely invaluable. You're getting knowledge, you're taking away an understanding, you're able to then tr uh, transmit that onto the other people that you work with. But then you need motivation, and certain expectations are going to impact on that motivation the same as it does with our patients. Is that enough to get action going? Who here is motivated? Who would like to be not to know that you're in that top 10% of clinicians who are doing evidence-based practice the right way and there's nothing else you could do to improve your practice? I think all of us would be in that boat. But does that mean we actually make a decision and a commitment to do that? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Other things get in the way. We have other competing priorities. So in our models, we build in a decision line. And that's the point at which someone makes a, a, a conscious decision for their own particular reasons to take action, whatever that action might be. As a patient, your recommended actions. As a clinician, it might be making that choice yourself that, yes, I am going to try and improve my practice. Now, if you're talking to a patient and they're still stuck somewhere above the line in one of these other processes, then there's absolutely no point giving them things to do when they walk out of your consultation. Why? Because they're probably not going to do them. Even with good intent, if they haven't made that commitment, they're not going to. But their knowledge and their understanding, for example, of their pain and pain dynamics and what to expect as they recover over time, what the patterns will be, if they have misunderstanding there, then they're not going to go and make those changes. So that's interesting. If you can detect that someone is above the line, what you can do is interact differently with them to increase their motivation to get them to the line. Don't bother going into goal setting and action planning. That will just potentially create resistance. But below the line, it's not all easy sailing either because that's where you're really working on helping someone with confidence. Now, some people, again, are going to go through this process all by themselves. But where, there are, where there's low adherence in the statistics, you know, 25 to 50% of people will go and take action in an effective way. That's a lot of people who are not taking action. 
And for some of them, they'll be above that line, some of them will be below, it'll be the planning. Or you start taking action and then it doesn't work for you, something gets in the way, life gets in the way. How do you learn to self-regulate within this sort of process? How does this help you as a clinician? Well, if you know if they're above the line or below the line, that can help you to tell your intervention. We have brief behaviour change techniques. We know a lot about behaviour change nowadays. And as you have your normal clinical pathways, there is a behaviour change pathway that you can use to integrate into your practice. Um, and certainly our multidisciplinary team, we have uh, OTs, a few physios, a couple of health psychs, dietitian, uh, an, an EP, social worker, and a speechy coming on board, and even a naturopath. All of those people are using this sort of framework within their clinical practice. And Caroline Bills will be doing a workshop this afternoon to talk about how she has done this as a physio, as a musculoskeletal uh, a specialist in physio. This is the key. The key message to take away, and this is normally what people say to us is the most useful thing from what we teach, the Rick principle. And it's easy to remember if you think about it as Rick as in the person's name. What is the patient's readiness, importance, and their confidence in making changes. Now, a lot of you will have seen these things in the literature. Do you apply it again in your practice? Readiness importance will tell you if the person's below the line or not. If they're still above the line, either their readiness or importance might be low. Their confidence might be as well, but as a practitioner, below the line, that's where you can help them gain confidence, if they get that far. And knowledge is important all the way, but we give it a small K because we're very good at giving information. But do we do it in a targeted way just for that person, given their condition, given their symptoms and pain, and given what they're currently doing? Sometimes we tend to overdo that. So is the person above or below the line can be a key question, but there is a trap. So with patients, if you say to someone, how important is it for you to get rid of your pain or minimise your pain, what are they going to say? Incredibly important. If you say to someone, how important is health, what are they going to say? Very, absolutely, 99% of people will say very. So asking about importance in that way is next to useless because you can anticipate what that answer is going to be. But how important is it for someone to take action to actually, the, the recommended actions, to actually decrease their pain? That's a different question altogether. So you're going to get a different response and see where they're really at because everyone wants the outcomes, but are they prepared to take the actions that they need to take to get the outcomes, that's a very different question. In the same way, motivation to engage in best practice as a clinician, no matter what sort of clinician you are, you know, all of us want to be like that. No one's going to say, no, I don't particularly want to do that. But what's your motivation to actually carry out the actions, to engage in the planning, to change your practice? It takes time and effort. So, be, having it really important doesn't necessarily translate into action for all of us. So how do we do that? And again, the RIC framework can help you here. If you're a scientist, how can you get feedback from the clinicians to see that they're ready, willing and able to use your knowledge that you're giving them? The knowledge is so important, but it's not the whole story. As a clinician, how ready, willing and able are you to change what you're doing so that then you can help your patients with how ready, willing and able they are? So let's just assume that everybody wants the best outcomes. There's still going to be those things that get in the way. And using RIC can help you to analyse what's going on and then integrate more behaviour change because it tends to be the missing piece of the puzzle. We've got a lot of knowledge about conditions. We've got a lot of knowledge about pain. We know that we've got to transmit that knowledge to patients. But how do you then get the patients to do what you want them to do? That is to follow your recommendations, given that 50 to 75% of the time they're not going to. And they're not going to do it because they're being difficult. It's because something else will be getting in the way. And how do you know what that is? So when it comes to actually making changes, who's got messy head syndrome? Look at the environment within which we're trying to work. There's legislative complications, there's the science, there's new science coming out every day. How do we integrate that? We've got lots of time issues, we've got professional development issues, you know, we've got the entire biopsychosocial approach. What does that even really mean? What does it mean to be client centred? How do you operationalise all of this? And how do you do it in your limited time with cases that you've got to churn through? 
fortunately, we do have a clinical pathway that we can offer you to complement your um, normal clinical pathways. And you don't need to come to us to learn about it. If you just think about embedding that RIC principle in your practice and thinking about, well, is the patient above the line or below the line? Where do I sit in terms of my willingness to change? Am I above the line or below the line? And that's, that's an interesting thing to ask yourself. So some of our key questions, just as a prompt, and we're really happy if anyone's interested to give out these slides, we can give um, the NOI group the PDFs. Key, some key questions are really, it's, it's not rocket science. It's just simply integrating some simple questions back into your assessment processes, doing what you normally do with assessment, diagnosis, treatment options. Does the patient actually know all of the things they've got to do over time? And a lot of the time we find out that they don't because we tend to give them very specific recommendations without giving them the overall picture and sometimes that can be the problem. All of these places can be barriers to change for the patient. Have they been assisted to collaboratively prioritise what they need to do? Because uh, patients go to a lot of different clinicians, a lot of different services, and in each one of those clinicians or services gives them one thing to do, that's incredibly overwhelming. Who helps them to make sense of that and prioritise what they need to do in a clinically relevant way? So are they ready, willing and able to make the changes? But even once you cross that decision line, what options do they have? Can you offer them a menu so you can really tailor it to the person? And then what actions will they take on a daily basis? Importantly, what will get in the way? And a lot of time it's going to be a daily thinking patterns and poor planning. So thinking or planning is a way of looking at it. You, can, it, you know, it can be a little bit more sophisticated than that. There are more categories. But even if you start thinking, is it their thinking getting in the way? Is it their planning getting in the way? You know yourself that you've tried to go out and do things and procrastinated. So if our patients are likely to do that, talk themselves out of action at the last moment, that can be the very thing that stops them taking action, doing their exercise regimes or whatever it else it might be that you want them to do. So when in doubt, there's a simple thing that you can do, and that's ask the patient. If you're not sure about readiness, willingness, ability, ask the patient. And I think one of the best principles that I've, I've ever learnt from one of my own patients is the KISS principle. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's keep it simple, stupid. And if we can just keep things in plain language for our patients, that's going to help them and help us. Um, and I think that's probably the main message that I'd like to put across. Ask Rick, think about Rick with your patients, and when in doubt, just keep it simple, as simple as you can.